aspect of all of us, uh, whether we're the surgeons or the therapist or the respiratory therapist or the nurses at the bedside. Uh, this talk uh, uh, seemed very exciting and should address all of us. That is surviving severe trauma, functional recovery after preserving life. life. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Giselle Bach, who is currently the trauma medical director at Cleveland Regional, one of the level three trauma centers uh, within the Metropolitan Trauma Advisory Committee region. Uh, she uh, finished her uh, trauma and critical care training at Louisiana State uh, University in New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, performed her general surgery and research, excuse me, general surgery and res residency at the Tulane uh, University Department of Surgery, again, also in New Orleans, a uh, very uh, hotbed of a lot of trauma, particularly tra uh, penetrating trauma. Uh, so I think uh, we're going to uh, enjoy uh, this entire talk. Dr. Bach, uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Ron. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of a, a interesting topic. I feel like we study and, um, you know, research and review and talk about so many of the, you know, the really the sexy hot topics in trauma. You know, we got the massive transfusion, you know, the penetrating trauma, the, uh, the Reboa, you know, the ED thoracotomies, all of those really incredible, you know, dramatic, life-saving things that we do at the beginning uh, to, to, to save the lives of our patients. And you know, there's always the dramatic stories of the extrication, what the scene was like, the EMS responding, all the things that they're doing as well. And then we really don't focus as much on what happens after the patients survive. And, and that's really the rest of their life. And um, I think is, there's a huge need uh, for more research on this topic and the things that we can do in the beginning that can help improve patients' outcomes because I think there's so much that's not known. Um, and what we do know is that there are a lot of things that impact the long-term functionality of our trauma patients. And so I just wanted to highlight a couple of things in this talk um, that, we, that, that there's a growing body of evidence that there are these major factors that impact people long term. So I am by no means um, an expert. You know, my uh, my experience and my focus is on that hyperacute phase um, when they come in uh, from EMS into the trauma bay, taking care of them. They're you know trying to keep them alive and then um, really stabilize them until uh, until they get discharged. And then a lot of times I don't see them. I may not see them for several months, um, and then and then when they come back, you know, there are always um, issues that are sort of ongoing. But as as a trauma and acute care surgeon, I really primarily take care of people in that initial phase, and knowing that there are these issues long term, um, and thinking about what we can do, I just think there's there's a lot of um, a lot of opportunity uh, for us to focus on this, and um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight it. So polytrauma um, is a term that I, I was kind of more loosely associated with that you think, okay, um, multiple areas of the body. Um, and there is stuff coming out of that it has come from this, the military. Um, and we'll talk about that. But, you know, basically, we just got through COVID. And so we are, you know, this idea of a pandemic. Well, trauma is still a pandemic. Um, it's Recurrent and a, it's a recurrent and significant cause of morbidity and mortality across the world, uh, despite our efforts. And um, and this is why, you know, I don't know if you've noticed, but we don't like to say accident. You know, we say collision. And you know, thinking about trauma as a preventable disease, um, but a, it is a major cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Five million deaths. Per year, uh, and the leading cause of death in people under age 45. So we're talking about um, young people, people in their prime. TBI itself is the single largest cause of death from injury, and there's over 5 million people living with a brain injury or with disabilities from a brain injury. And it, it's really interesting. I just went up to visit my sister uh, who lives in Durham, and she's 
very successful. She does like cloud computing or whatever. She went through her MBA at UNC and she was in a motor vehicle collision. She was rear-ended about a year and a half ago. And um, now she does tend to over dramatize things. Okay. But she had a concussion. She was, you know, kind of dizzy on the scene. She had, didn't remember everything. She didn't have a loss of consciousness, but she definitely had a, a, a brain injury where she had light sensitivity and, you know, had to decrease screen use. She had no other major injuries, but um, I was making, you know, my presentation and talking to her about it. And uh, she was so reactive to it that I could tell there is still this emotional association with it. She says she still has a lot of light sensitivity. She has to wear a hat and glasses and things like that. And, you know, there's probably other things going on. She hasn't even really, she can't even tell me about because she's, got this emotional reaction to it too, maybe even some PTSD. So, you know, it's something that is super common that you think about affecting people and just changing your vision and your daily habits or headaches and things. Um, so it's, I think this is way more prevalent than um, we even see in the literature. But polytrauma itself was a term that was coined by the VA in 2005. Um, and they primarily use it in regards to um, the military personnel, our soldiers who have experienced multiple trauma in multiple areas. And a lot of times they're using it in reference to a blast injury, um, but it may or may not include TBI. But it's defined as two or more injuries to physical regions or organ systems, one of which may be life threatening, uh, resulting in a physical cognitive, psychological, and psychosocial impairments with functional disability. So I think it's really important because the term itself, it, it doesn't necessarily define it as life-threatening. It doesn't necessarily associate it definitively with a brain injury, but those are aspects that you'll see. And when you look in the literature about uh, what polytrauma is, it's often including brain injury and it's often um, focused on the military. And so I think just recently it's starting to shift over into the civilian population. And that's really a trend that we see with everything that comes out of trauma. And I think the research and um, the practices, you know, from the damage control resuscitation, utilizing whole blood, all of those kinds of things are techniques that we have taken from the military and translated into civilian use. So I'm hoping that, you know, our awareness of polytrauma and our comprehensive care for our polytrauma patients, similar to how they do in the VA, is something that will hopefully translate into the civilian population um, in time. But, you know, just thinking about my training, um, we really have a well-established, you know, process for how we care for these patients from on-scene first responders with, um, you know, the jaws of life, extricating the patient, um, EMS on the scene with PHPLS and responding. We have very protocolized ways of approaching you know, trauma patients and patients who are in extremis. It's, there is extensive research that's been done, and there's still plenty of unanswered questions and is, is X better than Y or whatnot, but there's an ongoing constant conversation surrounding these issues as far as um, what the best way to approach them is. And, um, you know, ATLS, always put, I'm always pushing ATLS. You know, this saves lives when you use a protocolized approach to treat these patients because, you know, the, the injury patterns may differ, but the life-saving strategies are the same. And um, so after we have the survival of the initial insult, you have the patients in the ICU, we're providing the supportive care, and even, in, even that is, is protocolized or becoming more protocolized. And we'll talk about, you know, um, the ABC bundle, you know, briefly at the end. Um, but we get the patients through this, this critical point. So you have your golden hour, you know, then you kind of get through, you know, your first few days and then your first few weeks. And hopefully the patients have stabilized 
to the point where then they can transition out of the ICU onto the floor. You know, we make multidisciplinary rounds in the ICU. Oh, hang on. Sounds like these guys lost my screen. Um, I can still see it. Do you see it, Scott? I see it. Oh, some people see it. All right, it's back okay. now. Sorry. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, but right, so we're using we're using a multidisciplinary approach to these patients early on, utilizing um, nutrition, consulting, pharmacy is there. Um, some some hospitals like CMC they have a geriatrics uh, you know committee that's making rounds and making recommendations specific to those patient needs. We're using PT, OT. Um, they're even doing you know cognitive interventions with uh, brain injury patients. But basically, we're getting that stuff started early. The patient's stabilized. We get them out of the ICU. We get them to the floor. And then, you know, they're discharged. And where they go from there, you know, are they, they're going home if they can kind of get around. And we're assessing them. Can they go up a few flights of stairs? Are they, are they down two limbs, three limbs? You know, what, uh, what not? Do they need acute rehab? Or are they going to a sniff? You know, do they really need more supportive care? But, you know, like I was talking about, that's where we kind of lose the patients. You know, a lot of times they get discharged and they go off our radar. You know, they're into the world of rehab, whatever that entails. And um, and I think that's, you know, we can really do a better job of that. And it's, it's always difficult when you, you know, where are the resources? And I was, you know, I was talking with, um, I was just talking with somebody today about this, talking about, um, you know, her daughter that was involved in it in an MVC and, you know, she hit her head, she broke her pelvis, you know, and all of that. And, and kind of the, the lingering issues, whether those are chronic pain issues, whether those are headaches, whether they're, you know, it's how do we return to our functional status? How do we, how do we get home and how do we regain independence and what's our new normal life like? But when they're inpatient, we're managing their pain, typically with a multimodal approach. And, you know, when they get into rehab, it's primarily focused on symptom management. There is not as much of a focus or a standardization on helping them, you know, working to return to home independent life. And then there's even less of a focus or discussion on how do you reintegrate into the community? How do you return to productivity? What's your, you know, uh, focusing on wellness long term, you know, and and I think these are things that we take for granted in our daily life, our uninjured life, you know, and and trauma can happen to anyone, and then all of a sudden your life is completely different. And I think in in general the patients are out there on their own trying to figure this out, and I think you know we can take a a more aggressive approach in in having these conversations. You know, I, I mean, I after I made this presentation, I was like, wow, I'm really going to, you know, ask these questions when patients come to clinic, ask them about things. And so I'm going to highlight a few of those things for you guys today. So one thing that I um, read about that I wasn't aware about before is this polytrauma clinical triad. And this is a uh, complex disorder, again, um, kind of described in this in the military population, but just recently starting to be described in the civilian uh, population. But it's this combination of pain, PTSD, and a post-concussive syndrome. And like I said, it has been identified and there's an awareness of it on the military side, um, but really not as much on the civilian side. But the same risk factors uh, for the triad are present in the civilian population, and uh, they may be different, but they're still there. You have the immediate onset of pain, there's the emotional trauma, and then there's the head injury that results. And I, I think that mild TBI, this post-concussive sy syndrome, I think is really, um, really underdiagnosed or underappreciated. I, I know that I, as an individual and as a physician, have really not paid as much attention to this as as much as I think it it warrants. And you know, I think patients come to clinic and we sort of go, 
okay, yeah, you still have some pain. Not surprising. Oh, you're a little nervous about getting in the car. Not surprising. Oh, you're not sleeping well. Not surprising. But really, this is a this is a this is a, a, a symptomatology. This is something that needs to be addressed because it's affecting everything in our patient's way of life. Um, and they they feed each other. So that's the other issue too. You don't sleep well. You hurt more. You know, you have PTSD, that how you interpret the pain and what that feels like is different. All of those things can keep each other off. So one of the studies that I looked at um, was identifying patients with risk factors for the, uh, uh, for the polytrauma clinical triad. They were trying to identify these patients in the civilian population. And they initially identified them by looking at chronic pain. And then they just used standard screening uh, tools that are out there to identify if they were having PTSD and if they were having post-concussive uh, syndrome symptoms. So they used the post-concussive symptoms questionnaire. It's just 16 items, pretty easy to go through. They did modify it to place more of an emphasis on the visual and vestibular symptoms um, because the, uh, the screening tool in and of itself it, they were saying they were worried about being biased with pain, and since these patients were already coming in with pain, they kind of weighted it more heavily. They also looked at their um, sleep quality and self-reported sleep quality over a month, and then they just used the PTSD checklist from the DSM-4, you know, and um, what they found is there was a, like a 50, 52%, over 50% prevalence of the polytrauma clinical triad in these post-MVC patients. They just went that to sink in. 50%, half of your patients that are presenting for follow-up to get their sutures out or to get their chest x-ray after their rib fractures or whatever, half of them have this going on if they're coming in with chronic pain, if they're saying they're still having pain. That just really blew my mind, uh, you know, because I just think there's we don't pay any attention to it. I mean, I know I don't. And, I, you know, if there's others out there who are have been more attuned to this, you know, please speak up. But I can tell you in my 15 years of training, we never talked about it. Um, so, uh, but the post-concussive syndrome with PTSD, similar studies found that um, minor TBI was correlated with PTSD development. This is complex interplay within the brain, you know, something within the limbic system. I'm, I'm not a neurologist or a neurosurgeon, and the brain, I think, is really complex. And when it gets injured in this, you know, coup, counter coup, you have these, you have these hits, you know, you have these torquing forces. That is injuring the brain, and I don't really think that we have a, a very good appreciation for it. And honestly, that's probably why we kind of cruise over it because we don't really understand it and we don't really know how to treat it. But it doesn't mean that it's not having a major impact in our patients and their daily lives post-injury. Um, so, you know, the concussion and the minor TBI was present in about um, half of the patients that were being screened. And like I said, I think this represents a really high misdiagnosis. And it just, you know, really made me think about my sister. You know, she had this and I, I mean, look, I kind of blew it off. I'm like, okay, you know, you, you're okay, but did you die? You know, I mean, she, I, she didn't even, nothing was broken, nothing, you know. And like I said, she tends to be a little overdramatic. She, you know, she said the worst part of having her, her baby when she went in the hospital was getting the IV in. So she's kind of like one of those, you know, it's like, okay, you know, can you switch the IV five times to a more comfortable place? But, you know, she's having serious, you know, recurrent, symptoms that aren't being addressed and um and I'm gonna have to try to figure out a way to, to help her without antagonizing her. I'm the younger sister, so it's hard to not antagonize your siblings. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to talk about is um critical illness polyneuropathy and myopathy. So I don't know if this is something any of you have heard about. Uh, I think again this is one of these things that is really underemphasized and has a major prolonged impact, not only in our patient's immediate ability to recover, to um, get out of the ICU and to start working with physical therapy, but it goes on to affect them for months 
two years. And I, I think it's even to be determined. Um, but this is this has a major impact on patients. It's a major complication that occurs in severely ill patients who are in the ICU. It typically affects the limb and the respiratory muscles. So you'll often see this when you're having trouble weaning a patient from the ventilator. The, this um, disease itself uh, can result in prolonged mechanical ventilation. Um, and it, basically, it's an acute axonal sensor motor polyneuropathy. So what does that mean? It basically uh, is affecting the nerves throughout the body. Um, it affects the nerves in the lower limbs more often, uh, but it, it's also a um, primary myopathy. So it's two components, and it's really not well understood. It's unclear if it's the same process that's affecting two different organ systems, the nervous system and the muscular system, or is it two different illnesses or two different, it's really, they don't know that much about it. Um, but it, it can be a purely functional thing, or it can actually end up having significant atrophy and necrosis in the muscles, and they both can coexist in the same patient. So I have certainly seen this in, in lots of my patients, you know, when you ask them to squeeze your hand and they, they can't squeeze your hand and they're not sedated and they've been sick for three weeks and they're trachs now or whatnot. And they just are incredibly weak. And, um, and it happens. It happens to a lot of them. Um, but like I said, it's really an unclear uh, pathophysiology. Uh, for patients that have it, their reintubation rate is twice as high. And that's because they really can't maintain their fat. They have a hypercapnia buildup because of their difficulty ventilating. Um, and they end up requiring reintubation, you know, and I, I bet if I went back and looked at every patient I've traked over the past, you know, two years from COVID, I'm sure they all have, it, have had this, you know, um, but they get this symmetrical, uh, flaccid proximal and distal muscle group. They can actually have absent deep tendon reflexes. Um, it can present with spasticity. But one of the hallmarks is that the atrophy that you're seeing in their lean muscle and in their extremities is significantly more than you would expect just from being immobilized. So there is something detrimental going on with their muscles and with their nerves, um, but they can lose their sensitivity to pain, lose their sensitivity to vibration and temperature, but the facial muscles are typically spared. So, like I said, there is not a lot that's really well understood about this, uh, but we do know that patients who are septic uh, tend to get it if they have um, SIRS, if they have multi-organ system dysfunction or failure. Um, there are other uh, independent risk factors like being female, needing renal replacement therapy, uh, hyperosmolar states if they have septic encephalopathy. And the hyperglycemia is also something that has been um, shown to affect it. So this is like every trauma patient is at risk for this. Every patient that has, you know, uh, acute response to illness or injury. And it's complicated. Um, you know, basically, <laughs> this is like that slide that you put up that is, you know, 10 million things, you know, it's the coagulation cascade. It's just, we don't really know. Um, there are multiple, multiple issues that are, are, are proposed to be affecting it. Um, these metabolic alterations, um, how the hyperglycemia ends up playing into it. We just don't really know. Um, but it's something that's coming from this uh, you know, brink of death, you know, when you have almost died, but you survived, you know, what happens to your body after? And it's this really extensive derangement um, and that manifests in this motor and uh, this muscle and neurologic disorder that has major impact 
long term in terms of the overall morbidity and mortality of the patient and in terms of their ability to recover. So several therapeutic strategies have been proposed, nutritional interventions. You know, people love antioxidant therapy, people love vitamins and uh, hormone, you know, growth hormone, immunoglobulins, these kinds of things. You haven't been able to find anything that really makes any difference. So again, poorly understood, no great treatment strategies, <laughs> you know, and major impacts in the acute and post-acute setting for our patients. So uh, the major preventative strategies and supportive measures is, okay, well, let's attack those major risk factors. So let's aggressively treat the sepsis. Yeah, that's the most important risk factor. So um, also limiting the neuromuscular blocking agents and using the lowest doses of the corticosteroids. You know, a lot of times when we have patients that are spiraling, we will throw kitchen sink at them and um, put them on everything for that refractory shock. Um, it's also been, uh, you know, discussed about intensive insulin therapy, and this is kind of counter to the nice, you know, nice trial that said, well, you kind of want to, you know, under 180 is good enough. You don't want to overshoot and, and be overly aggressive with your glucose control because then you have the negative effects of being hypoglycemic. But actually, the studies that are looking at the polyneuropathy and myopathy from critical illness are talking about more intensive insulin therapy. Um, and it, they have seen that it can reduce the incidence um, in surgical ICU patients. But this is still underway. So this is not something that I want you to just go start doing, um, but just put it on your radar as you know, what, you know, what's coming out about this and, um, and what do we need to be aware of for these patients? And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, just kind of the metabolic stuff that happens. But the recovery, looking at the recovery and the prognosis, and it's kind of a spontaneous recovery that happens in a matter of weeks for mild cases. When you have more severe cases, you're talking months and about 50% have complete recovery. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means 50% don't. Um, uh, you can see that the, the rehabilitation for these patients becomes um, significantly impaired if their ICU stay is greater than four weeks. I mean, there are so many patients that we have that, that severely injured, that critically injured, group that's in the ICU for weeks. And, I, you know, this just made me think, it makes me think about COVID and all these patients who've been in the ICU for four or six weeks and just that long, long recovery that they're going to have from um, this kind of critical illness. But, um, you know, for the severe cases with this, 30% will remain severely disabled with functional tetraplegia or quadriplegia. So, you know, we're talking lifelong nerve and muscle damage. This is not just, oh, I got sick and I was in the ICU for a few weeks. This is majorly affecting the rest of your life. So, other issues. <laughs> so, this is, a, this is another one of the things that's incredibly complicated. Um, the changes that are induced by surgical trauma to the body, the metabolic, endocrine, and immunologic changes that happen are extensive, they are complex, they are not fully elucidated, uh, but we do know that the stress hormones and uh, cytokines like interleukins and TNF-alpha, those kinds of things play a, a major role in what happens to our body. We know that when you have more stress, you're going to have a higher catabolic effect. There's hypermetabolism that happens in the early period um, where you're having significant protein and fat consumption. We also know that patients with particular injuries, for example, extensive burns or head trauma, can have even more increased metabolism or metabolic needs. I don't know if you've heard other talks, um, but it's really incredible uh, what the demands are in some of these patients when you have these 
severe head injuries or burns and, um, you know, how you meet those needs is really critical in uh, those early phases. So trauma with the metabolism, it's been described um, by Tuckerson and as this ebb and flow. You know, you initially have this decreased metabolic rate during shock and then enter into the flow phase, which is the catabolic phase. And eventually you get to this anabolic phase um, once you have the initial trauma response mitigated so this late flow stage we can which can be weeks and months after injury and um you know i have certainly had plenty of these patients that it's like they just can't seem to put on any weight you know they're exhausted these i'm talking about once they've gotten out of the hospital and you see them in clinic they're just still whooped and I've seen it with my acute care surgical patients as well, where they have just gotten into this, it's almost like this chronic inflammatory phase where their body is just utilizing so much of their own energy um, that you have this whole body catabolism and the body is able to pull from these, these stores that we have, you know, where you've got some extra fat or where you've got some extra, you know, muscle that you can pull from and utilize. Um, and you can see this in your, you know, your ICU survivor patients where they've lost their lean muscle and they've lost their ability to go for their five mile walk or hit the gym or whatever. And they really have a long way to go to build back up those basic stores, you know, and some will never get back to that, that they have been you know, fundamentally changed in their physical makeup by their critical illness, by their traumatic injury. Um, but you do get this hyperglycemia initially that the body's using for that stress response. And I think you see this sometimes that these patients get into this kind of prolonged stress period where they're eating up all their reserves. Um, and so how do we how do we help them? How do we approach this? Uh, especially in the beginning. And, you know, we have this other major issue, which is malnutrition. Uh, so many of our patients are hitting the door malnourished, even our obese patients. You know, this, this is not, they may be, uh, they may be obese, they may have all this extra weight, but they may be malnourished. Their albumin may be two and a half or three the elderly population is coming in hugely malnourished. And I think it's really another one of these, um, yeah, it's a public health crisis. I think in the, in the older population, we see it all the time. Um, but the prevalence is, is widely underestimated in our hospitalized patients. It's as much as 50% um, and likely significantly higher in our critically ill population and our elderly population as well. But they develop that even if they don't hit the door with malnutrition, they go on to develop malnutrition. And likely this is a combination of this disturbed metabolic response following the traumatic injuries and that we're really not giving them enough, you know, or not giving them what they need that they are consuming themselves. And it's this vicious cycle where they continue to deteriorate then they are more at risk for uh, infectious complications and other things, you know, prolonged ventilation and things like that. And so um, their needs are really uh, are very high. And I don't think we do a very good job of, number one, assessing them when they hit the door and then frequently assessing what the needs are and making adjustments. Um, but you know, it, it, so you're talking about in the first week that it's present, that malnutrition is present in 45% of severely injured patients, and then 76% by the third week. So you can pretty much assume that most of your patients are going to be malnourished, um, either when they hit the door or in a couple of weeks in, you know, and then particularly paying attention, like I said, to that, you know, elderly population that's out there just not eating that much at baseline. But again, you have that, um, you, in that initial acute phase, when you're in this hypermetabolic, catabolic state where your body is burning so much and using up so much of its um, resources, you just have this, you know, very high energy expenditure process 
secondary to the cytokine release, secondary to the hormones, those fight or flight hormones, the epinephrine, the cortisol, the glucagon, these are all stimulating your body. Basically, you're, you're in this prolonged kind of survival mode. Um, and that your energy, they've, they've shown that the energy expenditure in trauma patients is you know, 20 to 50 percent higher than in an elective surgical patient. Um, and, you know, about three to seven days after the injury in the severely injured trauma patient, you're going to have increased lipid metabolism and insulin resistance with this hyperglycemia. So, again, thinking about that hyperglycemia, thinking about that polyneuropathy, thinking about those patients who are in sepsis, who are having this hyperglycemia that is, you know, hormonal and physiologic in nature, um, but then they're burning up their stores and they're not getting enough. So it's just, you know, a really complicated problem that ends up, you know, uh, that then at the end of the day, you have in severe cases, 30% are, are paraplegic, lifelong. I mean, it's just crazy. So you're, you're getting this glucose deficit and then mobilizing your fat stores because of it. And so you can kind of see here, you see that acute phase with the cytokine and hormone release, with the increased energy expenditure, increased basal metabolic rate. So you think about your basal metabolic rate of you're just hanging around at home or whatever, doing the laundry. Okay, then you get hit by a bus. Your basal metabolic rate goes through the roof because you're trying to, you know, uh, one, survive and two, rebuild. Um, and then you think about the head injured patients who have that hyperthermic response. You know, they're, they have this huge increase in their energy expenditure. They get this hyperthermic, tachycardic, you know, um, process going on that they are really consuming a lot. Um, and so you just start breaking down your body. You lose your muscle, all that lean protein. You start to attack your fat stores and utilize that. Um, but you just get this vicious, uh, malnutrition cycle happening that ends up increasing in increased morbidity, mortality, and immunodeficiency, more sepsis, more complications. Okay, next thing. <laughs> so I just, you know, again, trying to highlight that there are all of these things happening when patients have survived this initial injury. There are all of these things happening when they're still in our hands that are going to end up affecting them long term. And so we really have to figure out, one, we have to be vigilant. We have to be aware, right? So first, increasing our awareness that this is happening. If patients are coming in malnourished or they're becoming malnourished while they're with us, um, you know, that uh, these things are going to affect them long term and not just whether they get out of the hospital, but then their long term ability to regain their functionality in their life. And I think, you know, delirium is right in there. It's another one of these things that we are, you know, kind of aware of. We know it's around. We see it happen. We treat it, you know, but we're really not as aggressive, I think, as we need to be considering the long-term effects of what happens um, in our patients who are, who experience delirium in the hospital. And 80% of them will experience it, a majority of them in the ICU. 80%, that's, I mean, that's insane. It's such a huge number. Uh, but it's extremely common um, in the ICU and in mechanically ventilated patients. Typically, it's going to onset at about day two or three. Um, and it's, it's a predictor of a three times higher mortality in the following six months. Just becoming delirious in the hospital. And again, the elderly population, we see this all the time at our facility. Um, you can almost, I mean, you know, you can see it coming. You can really see it coming. But what do we do about it? Um, these patients end up having a higher cost of care and their ongoing cognitive impairment is present. So their impaired processing of their speed and executive functioning at six months after discharge. So this is months later they're still having trouble with their executive functioning and that it's a persistent cognitive impairment in 30 to 80% of survivors that their brain is now functionally different because they became delirious in the hospital. It just blows my mind. So risk factors for delirium and trauma uh, patients, if they're presenting GCS is less than 12, um, if they had increased 
of blood transfusions. Um, if they had a higher multiple organ failure score, like SOFA score. Um, and what I think is really interesting is that surgical and trauma patients uh, tend to have hypoactive delirium. So this is your trauma patient that's just kind of got that flat affect that's withdrawn, that's tired, um, that's just kind of not responding appropriately. Uh, I'm like, that's every single one of my patients, you know? Um, but that hypoactive delirium is really kind of almost more, I, I don't know if you want to say dangerous, but it's, it's, it tends to be under-recognized. It tends to be kind of dismissed um, and not, not recognized to be that they're actually having delirium. And then it's under-treated in 66 to 84% of the patients are not being treated for their hypoactive delirium. Um, the hyperactive patients, the ones that are actually in there losing their mind, bouncing off the walls, pulling out their stuff, those patients have a better prognosis because they are seen and they are treated. The kind of flat, withdrawn affect from your MVC patient who bumped their head, it goes missed. And they have the worst outcomes. They have the cognitive issues down the road still. And what's really interesting is that multiple days of delirium uh, are not necessarily additive, but rather it may be multiplicative. So there may be sort of a, an exponential increase in, um, in the effect of it, which I think is also really interesting. So just, um, just briefly talking about the ABCDEF bundle. So in the ICU, um, we have this. And, you know, just in the stuff I was reading about with delirium, I mean, we know, we know there are screening tools for it, you know, your eye cam and, you know, your RAS score and things like that. I mean, we have tools to screen for it. but We really don't do a very good job. We don't do a very good job of documenting it. We don't do a very good job of catching it. Um, and then treating people and, um, and some of the only, uh, you know, that's like, there's not really a lot of preventative measures, you know, pharmacologic measures, you know, can you just put everybody on a little bit of Seroquel? Not really. Um, you know, there's been st some studies that have been looking at a little low dose Presidex infusion at night to help you sleep. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, the biggest things that are preventative that can that can have an impact is the sleep hygiene, you know, turning off the lights, your circadian rhythm cycles. Uh, I mean, nobody sleeps in the hospital. You know, we're coming in every four hours to take vital signs. The machines are beeping constantly. Um, but things like making sure your patient has uh, their hearing aids in, making sure they have their glasses in. Um, just the other day, I had a patient who was, she was just getting a little bit delirious. Day two, she just, you know, she kept repeating the same thing over and over. And her son said, oh, well, I think she's starting to get a little confused. 84-year-old lady, you know, all of this, she had an infection, whatever. And I said, okay, well, what does she do at home? You know, does she use glasses to read? Does she read the newspaper in the morning? He said, oh, well, she does her crossword puzzles and she has a reading glass. I said, you need to bring those things. You know, you need to bring those things in in addition to starting her on a little um, low-dose antipsychotic and getting her a little melatonin to help her sleep. You know, those are the kinds of things that are going to help these patients long-term. So the ABCDF bundle, this is, um, you know, from the Society of Critical Care Medicine, it's evidence-based guidelines for ICU survivorship. So looking at, you know, how can we help people get out of the ICU and have a better functional status long-term? And in addition to things like family engagement, which is really important, um, that's another thing with the delirium is helping, having a family member at the bedside who can reorient the patient, remind them where they are and what's going on, that's really helpful. Not everybody can do that, obviously, but getting them up, moving them around, early mobility really helps with the delirium. Um, but the delirium is on there as well in terms of assessing it on a regular basis, doing everything we can to prevent it and managing it. In addition to having um, you know, the, uh, the spontaneous awakening trial and the FBTs. So, like I said, the biggest thing is sleep hygiene and preventing sleep disruption and getting them up and moving, um, getting them going. So, 
ultimately, I mean, this just references at the end. I, you know, I think <laughs> I, I, I put this talk together and then I was like, well, that's pretty depressing. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, I think at the end of the day, yeah, I was like, well, maybe I could put together a few um, quiz questions and things like that. But um, ultimately, I think we you have to have, you know, you have to have your in your mind's eye when you've got the patient every day you're taking care of them. You've got to be thinking about where are they going to be in six months? You know, how can I get this patient? to the highest, happiest, you know, quality of life, highest functionality, and keeping in mind, you know, not just, okay, um, you know, whatever about their liver enzymes or, you know, checking their kidney function, things like that, but really focusing on taking a step back and, and trying to have this broader perspective when we're dealing with patients about um, their nutrition their uh, their mental health with their delirium being part of it um, in the acute setting and then in the in the clinic setting assessing asking the questions you know I, it's something I'm going to start doing because I like I said I just don't think that we focus on it enough and you know I, I think that I am pretty aggressive inpatient about asking patients about depression and anxiety and some of these some of these you know issues that I think are are extremely common uh, that really have an impact in a patient's ability to um, get better. It's uh, something I, I talk to a lot of my ICU patients about and, and my floor patients. I say, look, you know, if you start feeling depressed, you know, and ask them, are you feeling this? Are you feeling this? You know, and if you start feeling that, let us know because we have tools. We have tools to help you and it's going to slow your recovery down if you're going to have, you know, if you're having this untreated depression. You know, but I think um, increasing our awareness uh, about a patient's nutritional status when they hit the door and being aggressive about it on the front end, being very in tune about the delirium, about that hypoactive delirium and being aggressive and treating that and managing that early, getting them back grounded uh, so that they're not just out to lunch for like a week and a half before we realize that they've been delirious this whole time, or we just don't realize it, you know, in that 66 to 84 percent of the time that we're missing it um but these are just some of the issues that uh i i thought it would be important to look at and to think about long term for our patients besides just getting them through you know that initial injury besides just helping them to survive you know now how do we help them thrive how do we help them come back to society reintegrate into society and be independent and you know they have the second chance at life now how do we help them maximize that and I think um, just being aware of some of these things and I if anybody's interested in research I mean I think any one of these topics and I think you could publish a paper so quick on any of it because it's so there's just not enough knowledge and awareness out there so um that's kind of all I got. I would love to open it up um, to discussion or questions. Like I said, I'm by no means an expert on any of these specific topics. And I, I think there's fairly limited information out there. But, you know, if you have um, stories from your patients that were particularly memorable in any of these, um, I'll just stop there and open it up. Dr. Christmas has his hand raised, and then Dr. Lauer. Yeah, Dr. Bach, uh, exceptional presentation and a lot of really great questions. You know, I, I think for many of us in trauma care, this uh, this truly is the next step in the evolution is the reality that our job for our patients doesn't just stop when they get outside of our doors. And the entire reintegration process is really something that that we never understood, to be quite honest. And and as as physicians and providers in house, we still don't have a good grasp of of what that looks like. And I know you know one of the things that's really helped us has been you know the the development of the trauma survivors network and and everything to help you know, help reintegrate those patients and the one-on-one conversations with the patients, but then also their families. 
And then another topic that you brought up is is the entire concept of mental health and PTSD in this patient population. We, um, you know, we started looking at this several years ago at our institution, and we actually found in looking at 500 patients over a couple of months that our, our PTSD acute stress disorder rate was about 28% of all those patients. So then the question becomes, how do you get those patients the help they need from a mental health standpoint without overwhelming an already overwhelmed system? And then the, you know, the, the third thing that is really one of the, you know, it's the big gorilla in the room is, is how do we get the healthcare systems and the government itself to really look at a return on investment and really putting resources toward these issues. I think it's very easy for us to look at and realize what I would call the community benefit and the years of productive life lost and what it means to get patients back to their jobs and their families and, and productive lives for society. You can, you know, you can put a dollar amount to it and and where we've started to get the legislators to turn, turn their heads a little bit is when we go to Capitol Hill and take a trauma survivor and they show how they got resources from the trauma system and TSN and other things and we're able to reintegrate into society and come off of government assistance. I think that tends to start the argument to get some of the federal resources but uh, the bigger problem that I've had is really showing the return on investment to a healthcare system just to try and get our own PTSD screening processes up and running. Because if it's not budget neutral, it's really hard to throw resources at it when everybody's lobbying for the same dollars. Yeah, really great, great points. And I think, you know, bringing up that, that the mental health and addiction in this country is just does not get the funding or care or you know attention that it really needs, especially when you consider how many people it impacts and how significantly disabling it is. Dr. Lauer has her hand raised. Hey, Dr. Bach, thank you very much for a great talk. I thought it was really um, uh, well done and a, a very important topic. Um, you had said something during your talk that I've been thinking about for a while, um, just about COVID and some of the complications uh, long term that we're going to see. And it kind of it reminds me of um, what we saw kind of in the early and mid days of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And we got so good at um, our you know, surgical skills and our ICU skills at getting people to survive, but we weren't really prepared as a um, Department of Defense to care for these patients afterwards. And so you had patients with you know, bad traumatic brain injuries and multiple amputations, and we just weren't prepared for there's like our, our success and our survival rates. Um, and so that corresponded with, you know, kind of poor resources for these patients down the road and, and corresponding, you know, as Dr. Christmas mentioned, um, you know, PTSD and mental health concerns. And so this talk really reminded me of just what may be coming on a, you know, certainly a national scale and probably a global scale from the profound effects of, of COVID and, and some of the severe illnesses that we saw or, and are still seeing. Um, and I just was curious what your perspective was and like how healthcare is gonna have to change in order to accommodate some of these needs um, because it seems like this is gonna be, you know, a, a lasting effect for, you know, a generation. Um, and I'd be like, interested in your thoughts. Yeah, thanks so much um, for your comments. And, you know, I, I, I think we are really going to see a lot of things. Uh, I think the way that COVID hit so many young people and how so many young people are now essentially having this chronic 
you know, lung disease, like really it's a COPD type picture. I think when you talk to our, our pulmonary colleagues in clinic, what they're seeing and um, I don't know, the ICU survivorship piece of it, I think we, I, it'll be interesting to see what comes out of it. But I, I was, when I was doing, putting the talk together, I was just thinking about all of the COVID patients I've tricked over the past two years and how they all had the, the critical illness, you know, the myopathy and the neuropathy. I mean, they were basically, they couldn't barely move anything, you know, and after being prone to the neuromuscular blockade and the corticosteroids and the sepsis, it was literally like every risk factor that you needed for that, they had it, the malnutrition, all of it. And so um, hopefully, you know, we'll see some good research come out of the pandemic and out of this critically ill population that we can then apply, you know, more broadly to to all of the ICU survivorship, including our trauma patients, you know. And I, um, you know, I think like Britt brought up, it's just a matter of, you know, how do you lobby for the dollars? How do we get, how do we, how do we increase, you know, the visibility and how do we get the, the legislation on our side? Because trauma is a public health crisis. It's a, it's a, it's a global issue and it affects everyone. And so, you know, I mean, that's why we fund the trauma system. That's why we put the money into it. Um, and, and I think we, you know, do a lot on the front end, and it's just going to be a matter of how does that translate? How do we take it to the next step into the survivorship side um, to help support the people? And like you said, um, really coming out of the military, and that's that's really where the poly trauma. You know, they have the VA has you know a whole like institutions dedicated to helping rehabilitate our soldiers that are you know that are dealing with these issues long term, and so you know maybe with the COVID. Uh, pandemic and crisis, it will it will help kind of emphasize again these issues and and hopefully get some research and some funding into it. Dr. Bach, you mentioned several things that it seems like we have an impact on um, with malnutrition and uh, the delirium. What else do you think that we could possibly change in our practice to try to decrease those things? Um, I mentioned in the chat box, uh, do, do you think that our NPO status prior to surgery could impact malnutrition? There's some literature out there showing little to no risk of aspiration uh, with those who are not NPO. Can we do simple things like that to try to improve uh, the patient's lifestyle and, and, and their stay with us? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I think that's a great point. I think it's been shown, you know, that patients are kept MPO unnecessarily for, you know, significant periods of time. And I, I was actually just discussing this the other day because, um, I, you know, I have a patient, a COVID patient with big D cube and uh, he's malnourished, you know, he's not getting enough protein in his tube feeds and then the tube feeds are getting held and it's like the tube feeds got held because there was some bleeding on the skin around the D tube. And so that, now his tube feeds are held for 12 hours. And I'm like, this is never going to heal, you know? And I told the GI doctor, I said, look, let's double up, increase the rate, you know, for the next 12 hours. And, and make up the time. And she's like, well, okay, but let's just, you know, I'm like, if you think it's GI bleeding, then irrigate the tube. Like it's not coming, it's clearly coming from the skin. And so, I mean, it's just one example, but I, you know, it happens all the time that patients are kept MPO. And, and we really, I think we do it without really thinking much about it. But if you're not operating on the respiratory tract or the GI tract, you can feed those patients and take them to surgery for whatever. It's not you know, and so I think some of it is practices that are sort of ingrained, you know, in dogma and not data that need to change um, with this growing awareness of how significant the issue is that it's not just, oh, they weren't fed for six hours. It's OK. And that's going to change their immune system. That's going to change their, you know, their myopathy. That's going to change their ability to, you know, do rehab. It, it really have to raise the awareness of it and, and change our practices to, you know, evidence-based practices, not just, there's so much stuff in surgery that we do that we just do it because it's how we were taught or that's what someone told us. And, 
you know, it's, it's about the data, not the dogma, our practices. And so. There's some great chat going on about TSN in the chat box. Is there any other questions for Dr. Bach? All right, I think we lost Dr. Singh, unfortunately, but uh, here are no other questions. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Bach. We really appreciate it. This is a great job as usual. Thank you so much for having me. I really, uh, I really appreciate it and uh, really enjoyed being part of